Hi, good afternoon. I'm Jackie Malaski, one of the summer interns here at Genetic Alliance. Thank you all for joining us today for another Genetic Alliance webinar on hot topics in genetics and advocacy. This afternoon, we're going to hear from three presenters about risk assessment and implications of these tests. With growing technology, it's important to address the societal and personal responses from genetic testing. Determining an individual's risk factor for conditions such as breast cancer, Alzheimer's disease, or even Crohn's disease can be personal experiences resulting in changes in diet, level of anxiety, or even no change at all. Our three speakers will break down the responses to these assessments based on their research and personal experiences. Our first presenter today is Dr. Robert Green from the Boston University Alzheimer's Disease Center. Robert is the principal investigator and director of the REVEAL study, a project meant to develop risk assessment strategies for those at risk for Alzheimer's disease. Our second presenter is Grant Wood, the senior IT strategist at Intermountain Healthcare. Grant has recently undergone genetic testing through 23andMe and will allow us to see how he has interpreted his results. Finally, Dr. Mark Williams, a clinical geneticist and director of the Clinical Genetics Institute at Intermountain Healthcare, will present about the implications of risk assessment from the perspective of a medical geneticist. Mark and Grant have created a blog, Fantastic Voyage, A Journey Through My DNA and Personal Genomics, that follows Grant through his 23andMe results. Through this blog, Mark and Grant explore different perspectives of Grant's results. And now I will turn it over to Robert. Thank you very much, Jackie. It's a real honor to be on this webinar with uh, Genetic Alliance. They have, we were just speaking the other day about how tremendous has their influence grown, and I'm also honored to be on with Mark and Grant, and I'm excited to learn about uh, uh, Grant's 23andMe. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to speak a little bit about the REVEAL study, which we've been doing for 10 years through uh, now three randomized clinical trials, but I'm going to speak mostly about the first randomized clinical trial, uh, because, and this is the one that just got uh, published last week, uh, because I think it sort of lays out the issues um, that uh, would be then fun to discuss. My first slide is just a title slide and shows our support mostly from uh, NIH grants and particularly from uh, Human Genome Institute. My second slide is uh, financial disclosures over the past five years. Importantly, I have talked to some of the direct-to-consumer companies but have not uh, received any compensation from them. My next slide is a, is a photograph of um, uh, Ava Gardner, who is a famous person who, who developed Alzheimer's disease, and reminds us that Alzheimer's disease is a tremendously frightening late-onset dementing disorder, which robs people of their humanity and really their, their very essence. Um, the uh, next slide uh, shows some work we did uh, a few years ago where we looked at the uh, risk of developing Alzheimer's disease based on whether you were in the general population or whether you were a first degree relative of an individual with Alzheimer's disease. And clearly, uh, the, the cumulative incidence of getting Alzheimer's disease is much higher if you have a first degree relative. And this has been known uh, for a while, but we were the first to quantify this in a way that was hopefully useful to clinicians. Um, and uh, we, th this becomes the basis for some of the numbers that uh, we ended up using in the REVEAL study to, to, to offer people. Now, just for those of you who, who aren't living in the Alzheimer world, the next slide shows established gene markers for Alzheimer's disease. And there are a number of rare deterministic mutations that act in a Mendelian manner. And, and it, very much like Huntington disease, if you, if you have one of these mutations, you're going to get Alzheimer's disease. But they're very rare. And what garden variety Alzheimer's disease has, has had for over 10 years is a polymorphism, a susceptibility polymorphism. That's, of course, the APOE gene. And the next slide shows that in any random group of Caucasians, at least, about 25% will have at least one copy of the E4 allele, which is the risk allele. And if you have one copy of the E4 allele, you've, you've increased your risk by about three times. And if you have two copies of the E4 allele, you've increased your risk by about 15 times. So this is a very robust uh, risk uh, polymorphism. And uh, some of the things that might be interesting to talk about uh, as we contemplate the, the huge variety of, of susceptibility polymorphisms that are being propagated for common diseases 
is, you know, is there a fundamental threshold where uh, a uh, risk, um, a robustness of risk uh, is useful and where it is not. But um, if you look at the next slide, there were a number of reasons uh, back when we started this in around 2000 why we uh, really felt we should explore risk assessment for Alzheimer's disease. We heard, of course, all the usual objections about um, how we were going to scare people, how we were going to damage people psychologically, how we were going to uh, give people information that they really didn't want or would misunderstand, how we would expose them to discrimination. Uh, and we respected all those issues, uh, but we thought we should go proceed with this because in Alzheimer's disease, there um, was a need to define at-risk persons to enrich prevention trials, and some of that's actually going on now. Um, there may be, we, we hypothesized at the time that there would be responsive subpopulations, and one of the latest trials of medication for Alzheimer's disease suggests that uh, uh, E4 non-carriers are responsive and E4 carriers are not. And we thought it was somewhat patronizing to be able to have this information and not share it with family members if they wanted it. And on our more grander days, we, we hoped that this would be a uh, paradigm that we could use to explore the entire process of communicating and learning about your own risk uh, for a susceptibility gene. And we hoped it would have impact on the genetics field that was growing. The next slide is this ACCE model for genetic testing most of you are familiar with. And um, it just reminds us that uh, uh, APOE is actually uh, has some very interesting features. Uh, the slide after that r reminds us that APOE testing has excellent analytic validity and extremely well documented clinical validity. It's, it's not really in question that it's associated with an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. The, the thing that gets thrown at us for 10 years has been, yeah, but you can't do anything about it. And um, this bothers doctors a lot more than it bothers uh, consumers or family members because um, family members are very curious and often want this information, and we'll, go, we'll talk a little bit about that. But what it also did is be, there was no market pressure throughout the entire course of these trials. There was no advertising. There was, there was no pharmaceutical companies trying to push people to get this done in order to get a drug. And also, if you're going to study the downside of genetic testing in, in light of a risk of a frightening disease, you can't get too much more terrifying than Alzheimer's disease. The next slide um, basically summarizes the, the whole purpose of the REVEAL study, which was to understand if the risk information is beneficial or toxic. And to, it, instead of sort of uh, taking this into the realm of ethical questions and trading opinions about whether it would be good or bad, to actually collect data about the benefits and risks, um, both psychological and health-wise, to individuals who chose to undergo genetic susceptibility testing. Now, as you can imagine, the next slide shows uh, uh, sort of how we felt when we started this, particularly 10 years ago. There were, there were no direct-to-consumer companies. The worlds of genetics and Alzheimer's disease were closely, uh, were to in total agreement that APOE testing and disclosure to asymptomatic individuals was inappropriate, unethical, and uh, really, really, really should not be done. And I can't tell you how much pushback we got on our grants and our papers uh, at the very beginning uh, for, for even trying this. And the layers of, uh, of caution and the layers of subject protection that we put in place through our IRB, through an external advisory board, and so forth. But um, we did move forward with the grant. We were funded by the ELSI branch of the human genome. Uh, and the, the next slide shows um, the question that we actually had to struggle with before we could even get started. How in the world were we going to talk to people about this risk? And you know, uh, I was telling, um, I was telling uh, my colleagues here before we started that I, I've now taken a sabbatical and I'm, I'm in the midst of the first year of a genetic fellowship to become uh, eventually boarded in genetic medicine because this whole process has excited me so much it's, it's actually changed the trajectory of my career. And I now realize that this is a universal question in genetics. You know, how do you talk to people out at risk? How do they understand it? But we came at it, uh, at least I came at it quite naively. and. Um, 
but I surrounded myself with really smart uh, multidisciplinary people from genetics, genetic counseling, and anthropology, uh, health communication, health psychology. And the next slide shows uh, one of my favorite slides about um, uh, sort, sort of how, how this works. Uh, of course, it's easy to tell somebody if they have a gene uh, variant or not. That's the switch on the top. But um, when you actually start talking to people about their risk, it's far more complex, and that's all the dials and switches on the bottom. And, and um, we had, as a result of our genetic epidemiology studies in Alzheimer's disease uh, for over 15 years, we had the ability to uh, generate models of risk that took into account family history and took into account gender both of which are important in uh, risk of Alzheimer's disease. So we, we, we spent a long time uh, working through that model and generating this first publication uh, uh, back in 2004. And the way we decided to disclose risk was really uh, very simple uh, after all was said and done. Next slide shows a graph. And uh, this is the kind of graph that you would have been shown if you were a subject in our reveal study. And if you were a woman who came to us, uh, enrolled in the study, and, and learned about your APOE. And you would be shown these three curves. And on the bottom of the curve, you'd be shown would be our representation of the general risk in the population. And you can see that it only goes up to about 10% by age 85. Now, some of you are thinking, but wait a minute. I thought by age 85, almost 50% of people had Alzheimer's disease. And you're right, but the difference we're talking here is incidence versus prevalence. We're looking in this graph at incidence. And the reason it's so low is that you might die of a whole lot of other things along the way to age 85. So the question we decided our, our participants were most interested in is, what is my risk of getting Alzheimer's disease between now and 85? And uh, if, uh, if you were going to die of a car accident or cancer before then, uh, we counted that as not getting it. Then the second curve um, uh, was the general risk of just being a first degree relative. And all our subjects were first degree relatives. And then the third third highest curve is the curve that uh, a woman we thought would have if she was if she had one copy of E4. And it, it goes up substantially, you can see there, to about 52%. So this is how we would present it. And then in our control group, I'll show you uh, the uh, design of the study in a moment. In our control group, we simply didn't give people their genotype information, and we didn't show them the curve that was customized for their genotype. So if you were a woman in the control group, you'd see the bottom two curves, but not the top curve. So the first question was, you know, uh, what if we gave a party and nobody came? Uh, we were mindful of the Huntington disease experience in which uh, surveys had shown that people were very interested in, in getting tested for Huntington disease. But when it came time for them to roll up their sleeve, <clears throat> then uh, a substantially fewer people, perhaps an order of magnitude fewer people, actually decided to get tested. And we were terrified that we, you know, although we had done surveys, we were terrified that people would not actually want to know. And we were also mindful of sort of uh, volunteer bias. So if we just put out an ad, we'd get all these people who are extremely anxious about Alzheimer's disease. And, and so we actually recruited in two ways. The next slide shows two pie charts. And the one on the left um, were people who were adult children of patients in our research registries. And you can see that when we systematically called them up and said, hey, we're doing this research study where you could learn a gene that might give you some insight into your risk on Alzheimer's disease, do you want to participate? 76% um, said, eventually said no. But what was kind of striking to us was that 24% not only said, yeah, I'm interested, not only said, yeah, uh, I'm really interested, but actually rolled up their sleeves and uh, gave their blood and got tested. And if you uh, think about the number of people with Alzheimer's disease in this country, something on the order of uh, 15 to 20 million, and you think about the number of their first degree relatives conservatively doubling that, say, 20 to 40 million, maybe 50, 60 million, and you think about 24% of those people uh, perhaps being interested, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's quite staggering how many people's lives this could affect. Um, 
uh, as you might imagine, among people who heard about us, who sought us out, uh, the number of people who declined uh, was much fewer. But it's still of note that once we told people what it actually was about, you know, you're not going to get a definitive yes or no. You're going to get a probabilistic answer. Um, uh, it turned out that uh, you know 30, 36 percent uh, declined to go forward of people who had actually sought us out. The next slide, uh, there's a especially geneticists ask this question: uh, Why do people want to know? Because everybody knows uh, that you you can't do anything about Alzheimer's disease. There is no treatment that has been proven to slow progression or prevent the disease. So why would we want to know? Uh, people. Um, actually wanted to know for a variety of reasons. They wanted to know because they were curious, they wanted to prepare their family, arrange their personal affairs, think about or purchase long-term uh, insurance. And they had their, uh, they had the, their reasons, <clears throat> and it was important to them. And then uh, the, the next question, which was really the fundamental question in Reveal, is what happens to them when they find out? What, and this was the question that confronted us, of course, from the beginning, almost in a catch-22 situation, because there had been five, count them, five consensus conferences that uh, actually argued that we should not be disclosing APOE to asymptomatic individuals. No one was really prepared to do this. So um, we tried to do it as if the information was a drug. And the next slide shows uh, essentially our randomized clinical trial outline where we randomized people into a group where they were assigned to receive uh, risk assessment with and without genotype disclosure. And then we followed up at six weeks, six months, and 12 months. Next slide shows a, a typical uh, res result uh, using one of our co-primary outcomes, which was an anxiety score. and the take-home message is that the groups were virtually overlapping at all times. Uh, the slide afterwards uh, is the IES, the impact of events score. Uh, there was a little bit of separation on this uh, measure at six weeks. This was a secondary outcome measure. It is a measure of test-related distress that is often used in genetic uh, uh, disclosure research. And although the E4 positive scored a little bit higher than the other groups, uh, the, and it was statistically significant at six weeks, uh, it was not clinically significant in the sense that no one uh, in the entire study suffered uh, any sort of uh, catastrophic or even clinically significant distress. Now, uh, that doesn't you know, answer the question definitively with this small number of people, but um, it is a start at looking at, uh, in a, in, in a, in a empirically driven fashion at whether people are distressed upon receiving this information. Skipping ahead to the slide that has the question, are they satisfied with the information? And the next slide shows that they were remarkably happy to receive this information, uh, even if they learned, even if they got what we would consider bad news. The next slide asks, can they recall the information? And the uh, slides after this the, uh, show that they do a pretty good job of recalling, even at one year, uh, whether they were E4 positive or negative. And the slide after that shows that they do also a pretty good job of recalling the numeric risk information uh, that we gave them. The slide after this asks, does the information change their behavior? And in particular, change it around insurance purchasing. And uh, the, the next slide shows that we are the first study to demonstrate that people did, in fact, change their insurance and purchasing behavior based on whether their, what their genotype was. So people who learned they were E4 were five times more likely, even in the small group, it was highly significant, to purchase long-term care insurance. And there was a trend toward a more purchase of health insurance. And then one of the last questions I'll tell you about today is, does the information change their behavior? Now, mind you, all these people were told, there's nothing you can do to stop Alzheimer's disease. But as the next slide shows um, by Chow et al., uh, they tried. The people who learned they were E4 positive uh, were more likely to alter something in their vitamins, exercise, or medication use that they thought, maybe from popular literature, maybe based on something else that they thought might help their chances. And, and the slide after this is uh, actually a worrisome slide, because the people who were E4 positive were also much more likely 
to order health food suppl supplements, to order and uh, ingest uh, unregulated supplements. And I think one of the dangers we have to watch out for is that uh, in some companies that might try to monetize genetic information by linking it to unproven therapies and preying on people's fears. So this, this slide is sort of sounds the alert to uh, uh, watch out for that. Um, I, I think what, let's, let's skip the next two slides which address some of the ways we address ethnicity and uh, skip on down to the slide that says stay tuned for these analyses from Reveal. And I think that um, I've told you about really what we did in our first three, three to four years, and we are we are now in our ninth year of funding, and we have uh, uh, we have completed and are analyzing our second clinical trial in which we presented the uh, uh, the disclosure, the educational and disclosure information in a much more abbreviated format, much more like what you'd get in a doctor's office or from an online service. And then we've been looking at other issues, like what happens when you disclose on, on, online or by telephone? What happens when you um, uh, offer this information to people who don't have a family member with Alzheimer's disease? What happens when you get people who want to learn about Alzheimer's disease, but they end up learning about another disease that happens to be associated with E4 as well? You know, it's sort of the, the surprise finding. And what happens, this is the grant we've just gotten refunded to start now, what happens when you combine genotype information and early memory loss, which uh, turns out to be a marker not only for Alzheimer's disease, but for imminent development of Alzheimer's disease. So we're very excited uh, about the, the future in the reveal study. We hope it's contributing to the dialogue across the field of genetics. And my last slide there is uh, thanking the many multidisciplinary people who have contributed to the uh, reveal study. And it, it's really been gratifying as a, as a true multidisciplinary, multi-institutional uh, endeavor. Uh, so I've gone a few minutes over my time. I apologize, but uh, thank you very much for um, this opportunity. Thank you so much, Dr. Green. Um, just a reminder to participants that if you have any questions, just type it in on the right and we will ask the panelists and get to your questions. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to Grant Wood. I want to thank uh, Genetic Alliance also for giving me the opportunity to present uh, for this webinar. In fact, it's the Genetic Alliance experience I had with the conference uh, a year ago that actually has brought me uh, to where I am today presenting to you. Uh, I want to tell Dr. Green that uh, this all started with the fact that I lack the gene that tells me I should be distressed about my <laughs> finding out about my genetic risk. So I definitely have that mutation. But let me tell you uh, uh, quickly how we sort of arrived with, uh, uh, Dr. Williams and I arrived at uh, putting together this blog. Uh, like I say, I, I attended the Genetic Alliance Conference a, a, a year ago, and I participated with the uh, Genetics Day on the Hill program, where they divided us up in groups of five or six people, and they gave us appointments to, to go visit uh, congressional and, and Senate offices. And when I found out uh, in the morning uh, who my group was was going to be, and I'm going to, I'm showing you here the the first post of our blog, and I'm going to scroll down here, so you can uh, see the picture. I guess I need to scroll a little bit further. Um, there's a picture. I don't know how 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 well you can see it, but um, uh, I'm in the picture. I'm on the the far left, but in the center is uh, Linda Avey, who's one of the co-founders of. 23andMe, we happen to have just finished uh, one of our meetings in uh, the speaker, uh, Nancy Pelosi's office, and we stopped and took that picture. So what had happened is uh, I had uh, been following the 23andMe uh, announcement uh, and all of the press release they got. Uh, you know, they, they got a lot of, of uh, uh, press uh, information because um, the connection of 23andMe with, with Google and anything that Google does gets a lot of attention. Uh, so I had uh, uh, seen uh, 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 pictures of Linda and, and on various uh, uh, TV shows and uh, newspaper articles, magazine articles, etc. So I was uh, uh, um, happy to see that she was going to be part of my group that day. So. It was a, a, an interesting day to spend with her and, and talk with her, you know, in between appointments and that type of thing. 
Um, and so when I when the, this conference was over and this experience was over, and I, I returned back to Salt Lake City, uh, 23Me just announced that they were reducing the cost of their uh, testing service from a thousand dollars to four hundred or three ninety nine, and I felt at that time it was it was time for me to go ahead and order the test. Um, also, because I am a, a work uh, with IT uh, in a clinical genetics institute, my responsibility is to uh, come up with IT related projects around family health history and storing genetic test results in electronic health record. I just felt that combining my um, my work in IT and this new area of uh, genetics and genomics, uh, it just made sense that I go ahead and order the test. So I did. And so in this first um, uh, post that we did, I think it's been uh, the first post on our blog was around the beginning of June, uh, we talked about that experience of, of why we decided to, or I decided to do the test. And then after receiving the results of that test, uh, deciding it would be um, really interesting to share those results and, and do this blog with Dr. Williams where I would uh, play the role of the patient uh, slash consumer and would talk about uh, my results and, and my reaction to them. And Dr. Williams would provide the um, sort of uh, response and counsel uh, from the point of a medical geneticist. So, let me, we have done a couple of posts uh, since then, or since the first one, where we talked about the things that I saw initially when I ordered the test, and that was of, um, reading all the consent and waiver uh, information that the 23andMe website uh, had me read. Of course, they talk about how uh, this is not supposed to be considered a medical test, do not base uh, medical decisions based on this information only please uh, consult with a, with a geneticist or a genetic counselor uh, before you make any medical decisions. It also talks about how um, they want to use uh, this inf my genetic test result information as part of, of, of research and that they are, a 23andMe is um, engaged in the new model around research they call Research 2.0. And that is, instead of being uh, uh, worried uh, about privacy and uh, so much to where they can't uh, or have a difficult time using the data for research or, or allowing uh, researchers to have access to the data, that we all agree ahead of time uh, that we want to participate in various uh, research projects. Now, they will uh, tell us as each research project comes up, uh, they will give us an option to not participate but you'll find that most of the people who do decide to do the 23andMe service um, are very willing to uh, have their information used for research. And that's, uh, we talked about that in another blog also. So then when we finally got to our fourth uh, blog post, which was um, in the, actually just the last one a couple weeks ago, uh, we finally decided to, to um, share some actual test results. Now I'm going to um, share some screens of my live 23andMe uh, test result. So you um, just quickly, you know, you go to the 23andMe.com website. You you um, sign up for an account there. You order the test kit. The kit uh, comes in the mail. Um, you uh, take uh, 15 minutes to to spin into the tube. Uh, you know, they don't want just a a little bit of spit, they want a lot. Uh, I just uh, assumed that meant so you couldn't uh, go up to somebody without them knowing and just take a small spit sample and, and send in a sample for somebody else. They want to make sure the sample's from you. And so you uh, uh, send that uh, tube in the mail, and uh, a couple weeks later you get an email telling you that you need to log in back to your 23andMe account, and when you do, you'll find your results. So, you know, the first thing that you do when you, you um, log in knowing that your results are there, even though I understand from, from working with the Clinical Genetics Institute, is that my, my results aren't going to be a crystal ball where I'm going to look at what disease I'm going to die of in five years. 
but you know, it's really interesting. I think we're all, as, as humans, I still have that, deep down you have that kind of um, emotional feeling that, you know, what is my future going to be? And so when you go and, you, and you, you click on the clinical report, you know, that's the first thing you want to see. So this page shows um, uh, the four different areas uh, that they provide uh, information on, the, the main um, uh, risk areas around diseases and carrier status, um, drug response, et cetera. So the first thing you want to do is you want to look at the disease risk. Now, um, so I click on that screen, and uh, now it shows me the 10 diseases that this service uh, reports on. So it's only 10, so it's not very comprehensive. So right away it tells me, you know, this is very early on in the type of information that we have around looking at disease risk. But they divide this up into three uh, categories, elevated risk, decreased risk, and typical risk. So your eye obviously goes right to the top, and you look at elevated risk. What am I most at risk for? And I see that my three diseases are Crohn's disease, uh, type 1 diabetes, and prostate cancer. So I look uh, there to the right of that, and I see some scores, absolute risk and relative risk. Well, when I look at Crohn's disease, apparently that's the winner for me, so it's at the top. Relative risk says I'm three times more likely than the general population to develop Crohn's disease over my lifetime. I go, wow, three times? That's an awful lot. Well, then, of course, I look just to the left where it says absolute risk. Well, it says, well, you know, out of the population, really only 1.6% of the people are going to develop Crohn's. So I immediately go, okay, well, you know, that's not that much. So, so maybe I shouldn't be as worried about it. Of course, if I look down to the third one on prostate cancer, absolute risk says 24%, which is obviously much bigger than 1.6. So that's something that I need to, to check into also. But since Crohn's disease is the winner at the top, I've got to find out what is Crohn's disease all about. Um, I really uh, had no idea what Crohn's was about. So I get to click on Crohn's disease, and here it, it gives me a, a paragraph that describes what Crohn's is. Now, if I want to uh, find out more about it in more detail, there is another tab called How It Works, or, or, or a link there that says Learn More About the Biology of Crohn's. I can click on those, and it can give me a, 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 a huge amount of information. A uh, very detailed amount of information about Crohn's. Now I'm going to scroll down this uh, screen because I want to show you. Um, there's two more bits of information on this page, and one is called an odds calculator. Now, what here? It, it once again it talks to me about what my risk score is. Now it says that over a lifetime for 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 my genotype, and uh, assuming that I am of European ethnicity, which I am, once again it shows that uh, 1.6 people out of 100 will develop Crohn's. But I know that, and, and we'll, we're doing this live, so we'll see if this works. If I select, um, oh great, it says my <laughs> time has expired. Let me, this, this is one of those things that you don't want to have happen. But we'll, we'll get back to it really quickly. I wanted to show you that um, that when I uh, select my age range for the odds calculator, that the odds change quickly. So let's get. I'm going to get back to there really quick. Stop lying about your age, Grant. <laughs> Anyway, so then you can see uh, that my, my odds have changed from that 1.6 out of 100 to 0.17 out of 100. So obviously the odds have gone way down. So this is very informative to me as to what my actual risk is. Now the next uh, item below the odds calculator where it talks about genes versus environment, when I read that, I learn another very important uh, concept, and that is uh, only with our, with our current knowledge about the, the heritability of Crohn's disease, that only about 50 to 60 percent 
of those who develop the disease can be attributable to their genetics, and that the remainder are a combination of genetics and environmental factors. Um, and we don't know exactly what the role that those environmental factors play. So when I read that, I go, OK, it's not all just genetics. It's also these environmental factors. And there's a lot of information around that that we still don't know. Uh, so that's, uh, that is a key point for me, that there's still information we don't know. And I know that as we get that information, that possibly my risk um, scores and information around risk will, be, will change. Now, the last thing that they have here is a graph where they talk about the 12 different uh, markers that were used that they looked at to uh, determine my risk for Crohn's. And as you can see, um, the green bars uh, going down below saying that those uh, individual markers, my risk has actually decreased. But at the red ones, at those individual markers, uh, my risk has increased. And if you add all of those up, both the green and red ones, then together they add up to an increased risk uh, that I've seen. So that uh, uh, gives me a quick um, uh, insight and information about my Crohn's risk. And I want to quickly just show you some of the other information that um, the website has. Now, uh, for each of the diseases, they have a tab called MD's Perspective. And so what this is, is um, uh, this is how I viewed it anyway, uh, is a conversation with a doctor uh, around Crohn's. Uh, let's say that uh, they are anticipating somebody taking their, their uh, information from this 23andMe report into a doctor's office. They're kind of anticipating the questions that a patient might have, and then, of course, given the responses that a doctor would give back to you. Um, and this is uh, very good information. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I have to share the, the last uh, question here at the bottom, uh, 23andMe. If I had the riskier versions of the SNPs known to be associated with Crohn's disease, what would you suggest I tell my personal physician? And the doctor's response is, because of the lack of clinical studies, we do not currently use genetic information when assessing a patient's risk of developing Crohn's disease. As the genetic and clinical research advances, we hopefully will reach a point where this information can be useful for patients and doctors. However, in these early stages, the main message to provide to your personal physician is this. Be aware that these genetic markers may indicate future development of Crohn's disease. So this is really good information um, uh, from an MD's perspective that they give uh, on all of the diseases. So another tab uh, has uh, resources on there, uh, in, uh, and they change for each disease. Um, and they also have a link uh, to the National Society of Genetic Counselors. So anybody who wants to get further information about what uh, their report might contain, you know, they could find a genetic counselor that way. Um, I wanted to quickly show, you know, one of the other areas was carrier status. And here you could see on my report that uh, the only uh, carrier I am have is hemochromatosis, which once again I had to click on because I couldn't remember exactly what that was about. Uh, but then there are several other listed here. And in fact, our, our post that we have, our blog post that we have coming up next week, we'll talk about uh, cystic fibrosis. Now, the um, I wanted to click into there because here's another important thing that the 23andMe report talks about. And that is uh, up here. Please, uh, uh, it's in this uh, sort of a yellow highlighted area at the top. But it says, please remember that the Delta F508 mutation is only one of more than 1,000 in the CFTR gene that can cause cystic fibrosis. Its absence does not rule out the possibility that you may carry another genetic variation that causes the disease. So over and over again, we find that the uh, 23andMe report shows what the limitations are of the information it's giving you, and that the information um, 
is not 100% complete because it's not reporting on all the mutations or uh, there's a lot of other uh, research that still needs to be done. Now, since uh, my time is coming close to and I just wanted to quickly show um, just a few of the other items that um, the 23andMe report has. They have a section called Research Reports, where they list uh, a, a total of 86 uh, more items. Some of them are diseases. Some of them are traits. Uh, the, re the reason why they put uh, some of these diseases uh, here and not in the clinical report is because they feel like the, uh, the research isn't um, reached the level of consensus yet where they can put it in a clinical report or that whatever risk that they found based on your genotype for that disease, if it doesn't alter your risk uh, by more than 5%, then they don't think it's worth uh, putting that in the clinical report section either. So, uh, and you can see how it has a column called research confidence and has uh, uh, a star rating. But you can see uh, these are some other interesting uh, diseases and traits that you can click on. Now, what I found here is that this, for me, was just a really good uh, opportunity to educate myself on what these diseases are about or these traits are about uh, and I can learn about them and who knows maybe somewhere five years down the road uh, these might become more uh, important for me to know about. Well, anyway that's a very quick uh, show because we need to move on we want to give uh, Dr. Williams some time to um, to make some comments and then give some time for some questions. So I think I'll turn this time over to Dr. Williams now. Great. Um, I'm reminded of the uh, uh, great uh, Admiral James Stockdale, uh, Ross Perot's vice presidential candidate, who, when he was introduced to the national audience at the uh, vice presidential debate, stood up and said, uh, who am I and why am I here? Um, so that uh, uh, sums up a bit how I'm feeling, but having done a number of these webinars before, I also know that if you go in the last spot, the likelihood that you're going to have to spend much time talking about anything is pretty low. What you're going to get is a, um, a quick um, sort of bullet-pointed um, reaction to some of the things that Dr. Green and, and Grant have uh, talked about, and uh, uh, this is, they're in no particular order. Uh, but some highlights of the talks that I thought would be worthwhile highlighting, and then we'll just react to uh, questions that I'm sure you have. Um, I think that uh, the REVEAL study has really been an incredible um, uh, knowledge to teach us things not only about Alzheimer's disease, but also about a number of the other fundamental questions that we deal with in uh, genetics and genetic counseling. So it, I'm really glad that the uh, 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 reveal study uh, investigators have been persistent in terms of um, pulling back the curtain. And I think it reflects a very important concept that I talk about in the very first blog, which is that in medicine sometimes we get really hung up about the idea of treatment and curing. Uh, it's something we hear a lot about in medical school, but in some ways we take away from the fact that really at the end of the day, most of what we end up doing is healing. Uh, which, uh, which includes uh, curing and uh, treatment, but uh, really healing is much more uh, trying to meet uh, patients where they're at and trying to listen to what they're concerned about and in some ways um, trying to reconcile that with what we may or may not know. And I think the REVEAL study has um, uh, really emphasized that uh, to a large degree, reflecting in the behavior changes that people undertake uh, in response to information that we as physicians say, well, why would you want to know it? We can't do anything about it. Well, what we perceive as can't doing anything about it relates to trying to cure or to try to treat or to try and prevent. But, in fact, these folks are responding to things by taking ownership. And as the um, uh, slide showed, um, there really isn't a, uh, a tremendous uh, disruption in terms of anxiety and, and, and impact compared to uh, those individuals that, um, uh, uh, you know, that, that chose uh, not to know. 
Uh, it was interesting, and again, I'm probably going to misinterpret this because I know the slides were kind of coming uh, without their complete context. But the one slide that showed the, uh, that the E4 positive individuals had a higher um, impact of event, um, th there was overlap with uh, the um, uh, scale for those that did not receive a disclosure. And that's something that uh, reinforced a finding that we saw in uh, Huntington disease. Uh, in this case, a very determined gene result uh, for which we had no treatment, where uh, the individual's uh, perception of quality of life was better um, if they uh, chose to have their test result revealed, irrespective of whether uh, they were positive or negative for carrying the disease, versus those who um, we're living in the uh, in that unknown, and and the reality is is that as human beings we can cope better with the known, even if the known is uh, is bad news, than we frequently cope with the unknown. So that's an important concept that we need to uh, continue to understand. Now there are positives and negatives uh, relating to that. I mean the positive aspects of um, finding out information is that it does allow us to take action. And in some cases, there may in fact be specific health behavior changes that would be highly beneficial. And if we can see that presenting this information to patients allows them to make choices to, be, uh, to, to uh, change health behaviors, to comply better with recommended screening, et cetera, that would be a positive outcome. Uh, as Grant was uh, talking about in the Crohn's disease, the idea of um, uh, recognizing that you're in, at increased risk, and if you began to have signs and symptoms that could potentially be consistent with Crohn's disease, abdominal pain, um, blood in the stool, um, uh, diarrhea, those sorts of things, that uh, letting your physician know that um, you had increased susceptibility to Crohn's disease could lead to an earlier diagnosis and effective treatment, because we know that one of the problems that individuals with Crohn's disease have experienced is a long diagnostic odyssey before the diagnosis is actually confirmed. Now, there are negative aspects of this as well. And again, Dr. Green showed that um, you know, one could argue that uh, spending disposable income on supplements uh, that are uh, not of any proven benefit may not uh, necessarily lead to uh, good outcomes. And in particular, in the direct-to-consumer testing market, we are seeing a lot of tests that are being promoted uh, that are co-marketed uh, with um, product. So uh, the DNA diet, um, uh, you know, the idea that you can um, find your perfect match using DNA. Um, so they're really promoting services along with the testing, uh, which then has to really hold um, this with a very uh, high degree of skepticism, and I think could lead to people, um, uh, you know, basically not using their personal resources particularly well. We've seen we we saw this in the Down syndrome uh, community where um, uh, there were uh, there was heavy marketing relating to diet and vitamin supplementation and paracetam. Uh, none of which had been shown to be effective in terms of uh, reducing some of the cognitive and other problems relating to Down syndrome, but there were these anecdotal uh, reports on the website saying, you know, send us in a blood sample, we will design a diet uh, and vitamin regimen for patients with Down syndrome. And not only were uh, the majority of them worthless, but very expensive, there were some regimens that were actually uh, prescribing doses of vitamins, such as vitamin A, that can cause uh, medical issues, and they were at doses that were known to be toxic. Um, I think also there's the um, concern about the consumption of uh, scarce medical resources following up what might be considered incidental findings. While we haven't perhaps seen this as much in the uh, DNA testing world, certainly um, uh, in the world where we have uh, sort of the uh, in-mall uh, total body CT scan where you walk into the your local mall and right next to the uh, Victoria's Secret is a, is a total body CT scan and, and you get that done and they find something and we know that the vast majority of things that are found are incidental, uh, but uh, they say, well, you know, we don't do anything to follow those up. We just give you your scan results and we want you to consult with your physician. Well, people go in, they get additional scans, they get tests, they get biopsies, they get surgeries. 
uh, to tell them, well, this isn't anything you really needed to worry about. And the next thing you know, uh, you've spent thousands of dollars, uh, and some of the uh, procedures are actually invasive uh, and can cause harm. And then lastly, even though we talked about the potential benefit of an early diagnosis uh, based on known susceptibility, if that same patient presented with uh, abdominal pain and blood in the stool and said, I'm at increased risk for Crohn's disease, and the doctor immediately pursued that, they could perhaps miss another diagnosis or delay another diagnosis uh, that would require a different type of treatment. Um, I'm going to say two other things, and then I'll stop. Um, First is, is that uh, it's important to recognize when we're, uh, when we're seeing um, slides such as um, Dr. Green has presented that while uh, the uh, results around anxiety and impact are, are reassuring, those are from results from a population. And that at an individual level, the response to the information may be quite different, which is why, uh, again, taking it a uh, disorder like Huntington's disease, uh, we think uh, at the present time it is still very important for someone to assess uh, somebody's um, uh, psychological um, uh, resources to be able to um, understand how they might respond to this information because there certainly have been unfortunate uh, circumstances where people have gotten results and then have uh, uh, taken their own life uh, because they really uh, couldn't uh, think about that. So. Um, uh, it'll be interesting to see what the reveal study shows as they begin to test these hypotheses to see what is the important, uh, what is the role, if any, for genetic counselors in this type of information. And then lastly, uh, just to react to uh, the information that Grant presented in the 23andMe regarding the odds calculator and some of the risk assessment, in many ways this is a, a black box. Uh, in other words, you put the information in and an answer spits out, but we really don't know uh, for the most part, peering inside that black box, whether or not we can trust what that result um, was. And uh, if you're more interested in that point, we did uh, talk about that in the blog on Crohn's disease relating to the odds calculator and the uh, different uh, SNPs that were used. So I'm going to stop there so we have at least a couple of minutes to answer questions that uh, may have arisen. Great. Thanks again so much to all the presenters. Um, we have quite a few questions, so we're going to see how many we can get through. Um, the first question is for Dr. Green. Did the risk assessment um, study that you did change with the strength of the family history? For example, if an, in if an individual with one affected first degree relative versus affected parent and multiple family members? Yes, we looked at that, and uh, in our hands, there, there was not, uh, well, people were more likely to be concerned about their risk if they had more than one family member, but they did not seem to react differently to the information if they had more than one family member. Okay, great. Next question is, if 23andMe does not test for certain mutations, such as the BRCA1 or 2, then how can it give you an accurate picture of your risk for a disease like breast cancer? And this is kind of for whoever wants to take this question? Well, this, this is Mark, and I'll take it. Um, the answer to that question is, is that they say repeatedly uh, that these are not medical tests. Now, there are many of us that, you know, think that that's a bit of a um, um, canard in the sense that uh, uh, how can you say, how can you just declare that something is not a medical test uh, if, in fact, you're testing around things that we know have medical impact? And so the question from the, the questioner is a very poignant one because, as Grant pointed out with the cystic fibrosis uh, test, they're testing only for the Delta F508 mutation. And granted, that's the most common in the Caucasian population. Um, but uh, if someone were to not understand uh, that that didn't represent uh, all of the possible risk, um, then uh, it is at least conceivable that they could say, well, geez, I'm not a carrier, I don't have to worry about having a child, and they would uh, perhaps decline uh, recommended uh, preconception testing um, based on the guidelines of the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology and American College of Medical Genetics. So I think that there are a number of us that are potentially concerned about how accurately that information will be perceived and about the idea that somehow these don't represent medical uh, tests. 
Can I make a comment on that, Mark? Um, I am uh, probably the only person in the world to have gotten my uh, direct-to-consumer genetic testing uh, before or as I started my genetics uh, um, training experience. Uh, and and uh, I found that when I started that experience, I was struck by how, by two things about the way genetic counselors delivered information. How well they did it and how non-directional they were, but also how little they checked on whether the person receiving it actually understood. So I think you could also argue that having a, a genetic counselor lay all of this out in a room to you verbally, and then you go home and try to process it, um, may or may not be better than having it laid out for you on a website where you can go back and read it as many times as you want. So just keep that in mind in terms of sort of the uh, best, best practices idea. Yeah, I think that there's certainly, um, that uh, is still an open question to some degree. I would I note that there has been quite a bit of research done relating to the um, uh, transmission of information, and also note that uh, one of the standard aspects of genetics and genetic counseling encounters is to provide the patients with information that they can, in fact, um, uh, reconsult uh, as needed for that. So uh, there is an attempt to do that. Uh, I think it, it'll be a very interesting um, uh, thing to explore to really kind of say, um, you know, what really is the best way to convey this information? Because I think everybody would be in agreement that as uh, human beings, we don't process probabilistic information very well. And if you disagree with that statement, I would ask why then are lotteries in Las Vegas so successful? <laughs> I agree with that statement. Okay, thank you. So um, one quick question just to clarify. Are any of the speakers reimbursed by 23andMe? Uh, no. This is Robert Green. I am not. <laughs> no, this is, this is Grant. I am not at all. In fact, he reimbursed 23andMe. <laughs> I, I paid my, my whole, whole, whole way. Okay, and another question for Dr. Green. Did you assess whether individuals who have a positive family history and are E4 negative realize they are still at risk? Yes, and uh, the question really alludes to the phenomenon of sort of false reassurance. And uh, we, uh, quick answer because we're running out of time, is we did find evidence that they, uh, because they learned they were E4 negative, they did uh, underestimate their risk somewhat. Uh, they didn't discount it entirely, but they, it did tend to make them underestimate their risk. Uh, um, we had a very interesting paper that if somebody wants to email me, I can forward them where we looked at this specifically. Great. Thank you. Another question we have is whether 23andMe or other direct-to-consumer genomic testing includes family history in their assessment and what role Grant's family history played in these results. No, let me uh, answer that one. They currently do not uh, ask for family history information, which is, uh, from my point of view, an opportunity for uh, uh, the Clinical Genetics Institute to partner and collaborate with 23andMe uh, around that issue. I think we'd be interested in, in doing a project around that. Uh, as far as my family history, I, I think one of the reasons why when I looked at my results and saw Crohn's disease and didn't know what Crohn's was, it was because my family does not have a history of that. I am aware of a, of a first cousin that I do have that I think developed a, a Crohn's after um, a liver disease. Um, but other than that, there wasn't any. And I think because I understand the role of family history, uh, I took that into account uh, as I looked at my risk score. And I also took that into account when I looked at my diabetes risk score. I do not have any family history of diabetes at all. So I add that to what the 23 me and me report said, and it mitigates it, in my point of view anyway, mitigates it a little bit. Yeah, I would follow up on that, that that's really a critically important question because uh, not only is there the opportunity for uh, patients to um, – uh, not have the full benefit of the interpretation, but there, but we hear uh, a number of our colleagues uh, who are saying, well, you know, family history, you know, we're, that's just going to go by the wayside because we're going to have all this genomic information and that will supersede family history. Well, family history captures something that genetic and genomic testing will never capture, which is shared environment and culture. 
And the genome does not exist in a vacuum. It interacts with the environment. And um, so the family history is an excellent way to identify not only shared genetic risk factors, but shared environmental and cultural risk factors that can actually lead to the expression of the genomic risk. It's the old uh, saw that you know genetics loads the gun, but the environment pulls the trigger. So uh, not having family history information, I think, is, uh, uh, is a real flaw at the present time. Okay, thank you. Um, another question we have is, with direct-to-consumer marketing of tests, how do we ensure that people understand that we are uncertain about their risk and that the science behind the tests are still being researched? Well, this is, uh, this is Mark. Um, I think the answer is, is we can't be sure um, that, uh, that there is understanding about that. Um, uh, the second um, blog that we did was on the end user agreement. And, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, if you've ever bought software that you've wanted to use and you, you've seen end user agreements, you know what they're like. And the, the reality is we don't read them. So uh, I, my hypothesis would be that you know most people really don't understand all the nuances of this and don't understand the science. Uh, but uh, from the company's perspective, at the present time, there is no requirement for them uh, to um, substantiate claims or uh, other than um, you know frank violations of what would be Federal Trade Commission. But um, these types of genetic tests are currently uh, not uh, regulated uh, at the uh, federal level. One thing I didn't have time to show on the 23andMe report was for each uh, disease on the <coughs> excuse me on the clinical report, they do list the um, the sites for all of the published research papers that they use to come up with the information that they use. So you can actually find those uh, papers, click on the link, it takes you right to PubMed. Thank you. Um, Dr. Green, I know that you um, yeah, have to I'm leave. I'm going to have to say uh, bye, but thank you very much for the opportunity and uh, best wishes to everybody. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Um, so we still have a couple more questions. Um, for Grant, would you feel obligated to disclose your 23andMe risk profile on future life or long-term disability insurance applications? Are you concerned they could be used against you in the future? You know, I've never been concerned about that because I've always been aware about, you know, the GINA law and protection there, I always felt that uh, if any insurance company who was going to use this information illegally is just risking a huge lawsuit. Uh, beyond that, I also feel like, you know, all of us have um, flaws in our genetics. I'm not any more flawed than anybody else. Well, Dr. Williams might have something to say about that. but. Um, you know, I just don't see how it could be used against me more than anybody else in the human race. I think we're all in the same situation. I, I just, that's just not one of my fears. And I think the answer to the question is never give an answer for something that you're not asked. And um, at the present time, there's no specific information on any of these applications that um, uh, says, have you had um, genetic testing, and if so, for what, and did you have 23andMe? And so I think what you do is you um, uh, provide the minimum amount of information that's responsive uh, so that you're not uh, uh, creating a fraudulent application, but you're under no obligation to uh, disclose uh, information that you have that they don't ask for. Okay, the information from 23andMe is very concerning because of the missing information. For example, the risk of Parkinson's disease is given based on a single mutation in a single gene. There are many other genes that play a part in this disease, and the risk does not reflect this. How do you feel about how the risk is presented? Well, once again, I, we didn't have time to look at that screen, but if we went to that screen, all of that uh, would have been explained there, that it's not uh, complete yet. And so as a customer of the service, I, it is on my shoulders to, to read that information and understand that. But I'm perfectly fine with that. I, I understand that this is very, very early on, and that information is going to be changed and updated. In fact, that's what has been interesting to me so far with the service is that when um, there is new knowledge, new research that comes out, it gets updated on my 23andMe report. Okay, and the last question is, with only 2,000 genetic counselors in the U.S., they could only counsel 4 million a year for an hour each. So how do we accomplish the counseling? 
Well, I think that um, there are, are a couple of issues. One is, is we're, de uh, we're definitely trying to um, uh, increase the um, workforce, not only for genetic counselors, but for geneticists. Um, there are, I'm not going to go into the reasons why that, that's been somewhat challenging to do, um, because that's been well documented in a number of different reports that have looked at that issue. Uh, the other thing is, is that it may well be that for certain things, genetic counselors, um, a genetic counseling encounter may not be um, uh, absolutely necessary. Uh, we've been contemplating the idea of doing uh, something similar to what is done in, in the mental health uh, area where you have uh, many different layers of expertise. And in our system, we have a mental health integration process where we have a uh, social worker uh, with mental health training that is embedded in primary care clinics. And so if a person comes in that has behavioral or psychological problems, rather than the primary care physician trying to sort out, you know, geez, what's going on and taking the time to do it, um, they can make a, an immediate um, uh, uh, consult to that uh, social worker who does a triage function, kind of identifies, does this person need to see a psychiatrist right away? Um, is this someone that uh, should have a, uh, an urgent, if not uh, emergent, referral? Uh, is this a person where the primary care physician could prescribe an antidepressant? Um, is this someone where we, you know, and so on and on and on, and they basically classify the patient. And what we found as we've studied that is that the, um, uh, the system works great. The primary care physicians have more time to, uh, to deal with more patient issues. The patient satisfaction is very high. The quality of care is high. And it actually saves money, even though you're paying for an extra person in the clinic. I think that there's an opportunity to develop a different uh, type of genetics provider that might be looked at, say, like a diabetes nurse educator, that this would be a genetics educator. This would be someone that could take a, um, that if a primary care physician said, geez, there's a family history of this and I don't really have time to get into it, they could take a, a competent pedigree, they could do interpretation, and they could serve that same sort of a triage function to say, wow, this is something that's really important, we're going to get you in to see the genetic counselor right away, or, well, this is something that um, probably is not as concerning. Here's some uh, vetted educational material that we can use. So I think we have to be smarter about how we do it. And, I, and one of the things that is interesting from 23andMe that I'm hoping that they'll actually begin to study is what are patients taking away from, these, uh, from this information. And uh, if we can demonstrate that some of these uh, presentations um, of risk are really working fairly well, then uh, why not take advantage of those in a more traditional genetic counseling setting? So I think uh, the, the solution is not necessarily uh, to just try and churn out more genetic counselors. I think we have to think about um, what the full range of service that we're trying to provide is and who would be best to do it. Okay, thank you. Again, I just wanted to thank all the presenters very much for taking the time and for all of their insight on this. So thank you very much. And Dr. Green's PowerPoint presentation will be available online shortly after the webinar. And watch for the schedule of upcoming webinars um, that we'll be posting on our weekly bulletin at www.geneticalliance.org slash webinars. Thank you. Thank you.